Tell me when we're ready. Okay, welcome to the uh, final panel of our second day of public hearings in Miami. This is the second set of, uh, of, of hearings by the Ad Hoc Committee to Review the Criminal Justice Act, cha chaired by Judge Cardone. I'm Ruben Kahn, the defender from San Diego, and I'm chairing this particular panel on this particular day of meetings. Uh, we're very glad to have you here to offer us information and to help us in this rather difficult task. Um, and it's a great group that we've got here. I'd note that you may think it's a little bit odd. We've got uh, five uh, panel lawyers, criminal defense attorneys, and a former chief judge of this district, current member of the executive committee of the Judicial Conference. But I know that Judge Moreno is actually a former public defender and criminal defense attorney in private practice after that, so it's actually a perfect fit. Okay. <laughs> and it's my courtroom. I feel weird. <laughs> and it is your court. <laughs> this is what it looks like, huh? <laughs> I'll, I'll take it. It is your courtroom as well. I forgot about that, that we're sitting in your I courtroom. I have, and I've been trying to case in the 12th floor. <laughs> Which we, th we thank you for the use of it. It's been very helpful. Um, so with that, I don't want to waste the time of this panel. I want to get right to you, and uh, we will start with opening statements. I'll start at the outside and move into the center with Judge Moreno having the last word. Why don't we start with you, Mr. Schaffner? I'm starting my phone as well. Good afternoon. My name is Gilbert Schaffnett. I am the Defender Services Advisory Group representative to the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals. I'm in my second term. And uh, since 1995, from the beginning, I have been the Northern District of Florida panel representative. Uh, and I'm also currently serving as, the, uh, as an advisor, as a committee member to the National Model Plan Revision Committee. Uh, so if you have any questions concerning the, the model plan and the national model plan that's under revision, hopefully I can address those. I have done written submissions as well. Just to give you an idea, of course, you all know where the 11th Circuit is. Uh, it includes uh, Florida, uh, Georgia, and Alabama, home of the Scottsboro Boys, and to be fair, the current national champions, uh, the <laughs> Crimson Tide. Uh, the Northern District of Florida, for those of you not familiar with Florida, is if you drive on the turnpike north for five hours, you will come to the base of the Northern District which is Gainesville, home of the Fighting Gators and uh, the University of Florida. That is one of the divisions driving north and west. You go to Tallahassee, which is our state capital. I'm told Tallahassee also has a university, and I'm told they also have a football team. <laughs> uh, from there, you drive another two and a half hours west on I-10, and you will go to Panama City. Uh, the other division affectionately referred to as the Redneck Riviera. And from there, you drive again on I-10, ultimately to get to Mr. Kahn's place in, in San Diego, I think. But ultimately, you get to Pensacola, which is primarily a military uh, base. And the, the cases kind of reflect the division. You've got a lot of drug cases, a lot of cases involving sex trafficking. You've got a lot of cases involving fraud, particularly in the, in the Pensacola division. Uh, so I've been representing that district since 1996. Um, let me just say this, uh, in 1962 in the summer, I was a 10 year old boy living in Connecticut and my parents decided that we were going to move to Florida, a place called DeLand, Florida. And back when 10 year old boys were allowed to go to movie theaters by themselves, I went to the movie theater on a hot summer day, a uh, segregated theater I might add, and saw a movie that forever changed my life called To Kill a Mockingbird. And there are three things that even as a 10 year old I took from that movie. The first was that when Judge Taylor came to Atticus Fence porch, he said to Atticus, Atticus, I need your help in representing Tom Robinson, a black man accused of raping a white woman. Years later, I would think to myself, well, you know, was Atticus on the panel list? Or how did Judge, <laughs> how did Judge Taylor pick him out? I suspect he's the only judge and Atticus was the only lawyer. Atticus, as you remember, was known for doing civil work and he was doing civil work in exchange for chickens and hogs, and he took on that representation, not having done criminal work, and did, as you saw, an amazing job. The second thing that I took from that movie back then, and particularly now, was when he got his butt handed to him by the all-male jury, uh, and he was getting ready to leave, Pastor Sykes turned to Jem to, to, and to, to Scout and said, 
rise, your father is passing. And even as a 10-year-old, I thought to myself as they're standing in that segregated courtroom, what a wonderful thing to be respected like that, to have the respect of, of your peers. And then the third thing that I took from that movie was after Tom Robinson had supposedly escaped and uh, Atticus had the difficult job of going to Tom Robinson's family and informing him that he had been shot dead. Uh, I'm sure he would not get windshield time for that voucher to go to inform them of the death. Uh, Jem and, and Scout were talking to Miss Addison and she said to them something that always stuck with me because they asked, well, you know, why is my dad doing this? And what he said, or what she said was, Jem, there are some people that are put on the earth to do things that are difficult. Uh, your father is one of those people. And those are the three things that stuck with me from that movie. That movie is, was filmed, or you know, Gregory Peck went to Monroeville, Louis, or Monroeville, Alabama, a place that I ended up going and, and visiting. Uh, the courthouse is still there. A year later, uh, uh, Gideon wrote his famous writ uh, to the United States Supreme Court. Gideon accused of robbing and, and burglarizing a, a, a pool hall in Panama City, Florida, in my district uh, in 1963. So along the way, that was my inspiration. I became a panel lawyer in 1984 and became the first panel rep in, in 1998. I just wanted to say this. Um, when I first got the panel list, uh, as, as Joel Hosmet said, there were a lot of dead people. I see dead people. Our list was <laughs> literally included dead people on the list. So we revised the list. I think we have an outstanding system right now to pick panel lawyers. Uh, we have an outstanding set of judges. Uh, you won't hear a lot of complaints um, from, my, from me and my district. But I do have some, some things I want to bring to your attention, one that is particularly disturbing in my district and I suspect in other districts, and that is the aging out of the panel. Everyone on my panel is my age or older, they're retiring, they're all white, they're all male, and I fear for the future of the panel despite all my best efforts in getting younger people and a more diverse panel. So I'll be glad to discuss that at a later time. Thank you. Thank you. I go to the opposite end to you, Mr. Bovet. Thank you, sir. I'm Steve Bovet. I'm an attorney in private practice in, in Savannah, Georgia, which is the Southern District of Georgia. And uh, I serve our federal court on the advisory committee. I serve as the district representative to the CJA panel. And I also serve as a CJA resource counsel. And I'll be happy to explain that a little when, when we get to the question and answer period. When I heard Ms. Salvini describe her relationship with her public defender, her, pro, her panel administrator, I was struck by the fact that most of the upstate South Carolina is separated from my district by a river, the Savannah River. She might as well have been describing an alternate universe because I had no idea what she was talking about. Every year I go to the national panel and I talk to new people there and tell them that I don't have a federal public defender and I have a CJA panel that is comprised of 3,000 lawyers. If you can practice in our district, you're subject to appointment. They asked me what kind of backwater place it is. <laughs> Difficult place because it's been home to me for 23 years. In my written comments, I focused on two time periods, pre-2011 and post-2011. And the reason for that was, was simple and uh, perhaps delusional, but I am hopeful uh, that we're seeing some movement in our district, glacially slow, and it probably will remain that way. And I'm hoping that my comments here will maybe prod some change, but in April 2011, the court sent out a questionnaire and allowed people to either opt in or opt out of being appointed under the CJA Act. Uh, that was a huge change in our district uh, because the, some of the prior administration, I'll say, uh, absolutely uh, was not open to that suggestion. About 200 lawyers opted in and said that they were willing to accept appointments on CJA cases. That's probably grown to maybe about 225 while an improvement, it is minimal and incremental, and there's a lot of work to still be done. Uh, representation in our district uh, falls to those lucky enough that maybe get somebody competent. And there's far too few accepting those cases. Although these attorneys expressed a desire to be appointed, um, 
there's been no steps to ensure that they have any competence. We have no admission other than calling up and saying, hey, put me on the panel. There's no review as to whether or not you stay on the panel, and whether you're competent. There's just no criteria. Attorneys are appointed because they get called up by the courts, or the magistrate judges, docketing clerk 90% of the time. Many of the people on the list when I review it are simply lawyers from larger or mid-sized firms. They're new associates. They've been practicing for six months to a year, two years. And for many reasons, those firms want those lawyers to be taking these cases. I don't think any of those reasons have anything to do with actually representing a criminal defendant. And I don't think you should cut your teeth representing a criminal defendant. It's not the place. When I started in the Marine Corps many years ago, you were not allowed to be a criminal defense lawyer in the Marine Corps, which is not the most progressive of uh, organizations, until you had been a trial counsel for at least a year. You weren't going to learn the basics representing somebody accused of a crime. That change also came during the period of an economic downturn in this country. Uh, many lawyers that I've spoke to agreed to be on the panel because when you got out in our rural areas, $129 an hour ain't bad because you're probably not getting it from privately retained clients out there. So they are on the panel and they want to be on the panel. The majority of this panel, or these 200 lawyers now that are supposed to get the appointments, have no intention of practicing criminal law. They aren't criminal law specialists by any mean. And I believe you have to be, to be effective, to be a criminal law specialist and know what you're doing. And you have to have enough cases a year to remain competent and current. My last comment will be uh, the absolute need in my district for a federal public defender and a federal public defender office to counterbalance an extremely professional United States Attorney's Office that has 28 lawyers, 17 of whom do nothing but criminal defense work, most of them career prosecutors. And they're practicing against six month, one month, one year, two year junior attorneys and associates. We need a federal public defender's office in the United States Attorney's in, in in Southern District. Mr. Povey, can you just pull that mic a little bit over in front of you? The, I, in preparing for this, I, one of the things I did do, I wanted to get a realistic idea of would an office be viable? Because the cases I hear about are usually these huge multi-defendant ones, and so you, federal public defender is only going to be able to represent one person. So I had a clerk's office break down for me what the breakout of it was, and we average about 600 indictments a year over the last five years in the district. And of those 600, 45 on average a year were multi-defendant cases. So that leaves somewhere in the neighborhood of 550 individual defendants that probably could have been represented by a federal public defender office. The vast majority of those individuals would have received far better service with a dedicated federal, de federal public defender office. Thank you for the opportunity to address the panel. Thank you. Mr. McCann. Good afternoon. Uh, Judge Cardone, thank you for your invitation to appear today. Um, I've sat in on yesterday's proceedings and most of today's, and um, the discussions have been very enlightening. I've been at this a long time, and every time I come to one of these regional meetings or national meetings, I am somewhat uh, surprised uh, uh, by the differences throughout the country and how things are done. And I hope the work of this committee and its reason for these hearings will maybe uh, improve uh, uh, some districts and, and educate others. Um, my epiphany in this kind of work was not like going to the movies in Florida at 10, but out of law school um, looking for work, I got a job in the South Carolina Department of Corrections as an ombudsman, and uh, which meant I went behind the walls. And, the wall in the big house, as they called it in Columbia. And it was clear to me very soon that there are two different kinds of justice in this country, the type you pay for and the type where you don't have the money and you take what you get for a lawyer. And that hit me hard. So most of the people I dealt with be in the Department of Corrections. Um, this would have been in 1973. Many of them were there way before appointed counsel was uh, mandatory uh, had clearly been given the short end of the stick. So from there on until today, I've been in the criminal law practice uh, uh, 
steel. Uh, we have, the District of South Carolina encompasses the whole state. We have four separate divisions. Uh, as Ms. Salvini told you today, she's a co-rep in the northern part of the state. We have two other uh, co-reps throughout. There are about 225 lawyers on the panel complete. Basically four separate panels that handle the matters in Charleston, Columbia, Spartanburg, and Florence. Most of my practice, almost 95% of in federal district court has been in Charleston, um, where I uh, have a closer management of the, the panels there. Um, we do have a CJA committee that uh, the speaker down to the left uh, on the last panel talked about it being needed in Tampa, <coughs> where we screen applications, uh, take care of other administrative problems, whether they be disciplinary problems with a member of the panel. Um, our, we haven't appointed anybody to the panel in over a year. The cases have been down, and I think that's true throughout the court, uh, the court system. Uh, <clears throat> we, uh, we have a pretty good system. It works pretty well most of the time. There were some instances of cutting, as uh, was reflected in the NACTL report, and I think was presented to, a, I think, the uh, a committee last uh, December, I believe it was, in New Orleans, about a, a serious cut of a voucher at the Fourth Circuit level. Um, I'd be happy to address that if that question comes up. Again, uh, thank you for uh, allowing me to be here. Uh, is there any questions the panel may have? Thank you. Ms. Brill? Thank you. I am Rachel Brill. I practice in the District of Puerto Rico and before the First Circuit. I very much appreciate the opportunity to testify before and address this committee today. In my written testimony, I presented three different areas of concern, and I'd, I'd hoped, uh, and I hope today, to, um, to make each of those areas a little more concrete um, for the committee. Uh, but given um, Mr. Khan's admonition, I'll try to, I'll, I'll, I'll shorten even what I was intending to present and, and um, just give a, a few uh, concrete examples for um, each of those areas and, and why I think it's important ultimately to have, as so many people have testified before this committee, independent um, review of panel selection, panel appointment, and panel voucher review. Um, the first area, uh, that I uh, mentioned in my own written testimony uh, was, and uh, I'm paraphrasing here and using adjectives I didn't use in the written testimony, unfair, petty, demoralizing, debilitating voucher review that we have in our district. Um, and I'll skip the example uh, that I was gonna give from my own experience. Um, I will, that, that particular example was from a particular judge. It doesn't happen with every single judge. But on the whole, and in the clerk's office in our district, uh, and particularly the clerk's office, but several judges as well, view every single uh, voucher, every single presentation from defense attorneys with, with disdain, not with respect. And they treat lawyers like mercenaries, not professionals. And this is a conclusion that I've come to after many years and many experiences and, and a lot of thought and a lot of even uh, heartbreak. Uh, and the example, the concrete example that I wanted to present um, was, is, involves a, a colleague who, a dear colleague and panel member who passed away suddenly in 2014. And he was quite a character and he was quite um, uh, a presence and he was quite irreverent. So I don't think he'd mind if I characterize this portion of what I'm about to say as the case of the reductions to the dead man's voucher. Um, he, this attorney got, got sick in 2010. He received treatment for a couple of years. Uh, we all thought that he'd gotten better and he passed away, as I said, suddenly in 2014. A few of us uh, got together to help his stunned and, and you know, um, desperate widow um, and we learned in the course of all that, that he hadn't filed a voucher since he got sick, since 2010. And there was 
times when he had absented himself, he wasn't taking cases, there were 41 outstanding vouchers. Some were very small, but some were somewhat substantial. And we took it upon ourselves to try to collect whatever evidence we could and file, um, file the vouchers on his behalf. They, as I said, some were small, some were more substantial, all were very meaningful to his widow. And um, pass over, I'll pass over how difficult it was to get the authorization for any of us to file on her behalf, how time consuming it was to get approval for interim vouchers in this particular case. There was one voucher, it totaled um, less than $2,000. It was for a complete case from start to finish, but all we could piece together from the documents that we got from the court docket sheet was an amount that was somewhere between $1,800 and, and $2,000. And I got an email, well, actually the attorney got an email and I got copied on the email. So, trying to be irreverent and morbid. Um, and, uh, and what I was told, and this was for a total of 0.3 hours, was that the time invoiced for reviewing docket documents was adjusted as to reasonableness and or grouped with other entries to reflect the complexity and the length of the documents reviewed. And that if I wanted to challenge this recommendation, I had four days to uh, write back. And I wondered where I could go to kind of challenge all of this and say that yes, the time had been spent. Any, anything that was placed on the voucher, there was some kind of documentary support, there was some kind of piece of paper, there was something in the files that his family could piece together. And I objected. And I wrote all that down and, and I got a call from the district judge. And the district judge said that this clerk's office was recommending this reduction and that it only amounted to $37.80, and what did I think? And I said again, you know, I, we, everything that we filed, there was a piece of paper, there was some kind of a support, and, um, and the court reinstated that time. And, and um, the bad taste from that episode hasn't gone away. <clears throat> um, on the one hand, I spend most of my professional time as a lawyer, as a defense attorney, uh, speaking up for people who, for one reason or another, can't speak for themselves. And of course, that episode was no exception. But it left uh, an indelible impression of the lack of regard, the disdain that I've spoken about for what criminal defense lawyers do. And I, I give it as a hopefully slightly memorable um, um, concrete example of what we face every day and smaller and larger, to smaller and larger degrees. Um, the situation with experts and third-party service providers in our district is even worse. It's very cumbersome for CJA attorneys to, attorneys to request experts and third-party service providers. It's even more cumbersome for those experts to eventually get paid. Uh, it's something that is just draining and, um, and, and difficult. There came a point where I made a proposal. I said, well, can we try to um, streamline this process in some way. Can they file paper vouchers the way they used to because things are done electronically now in our district? No, everything has to be electronic. So, okay, well, can we streamline it that way? Can we just make it completely electronic, take it off of the docket? The U.S. Attorney's Office never has to see that we ask for a, a, an expert. Uh, it doesn't become a matter of litigation. It's instead of <clears throat> 10 steps, it's six steps. And I had consulted with some people in the Defender Services Office and I made a, you know, proposal that was designed simply to streamline the process, not to take anything out of anybody's eyes. And instead of a, a response that said, well, this is what it would take to change our workflow, to streamline your process, we got a 90-page PowerPoint presentation of, honestly, I, 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 I couldn't summarize it, but just that it would just be too um, difficult for the clerk's office to not keep on doing things the way that things uh, continue to be done. And so we still have a very cumbersome and difficult um, process when it comes to experts. That I'm skipping over what so many people have already spoken about, which is people not even asking for experts because they know they're going to get denied. People asking for the experts and them getting denied. I'm simply saying that even when you're lucky enough to have a, a voucher for an expert approved or have done the tremendous amount of work that it takes to get a voucher, a, a, a expert uh, services or third party services approved, it's still um, a tremendously cumbersome, obstacle filled process. Um, I, just the 30 more seconds to say that, that um, 
I, I can address, and I'm sure the committee, because I've been here all day, and so I know what the committee has already heard, and I, I'm sure you'll have questions about the third area, which is information and the access to information or the accuracy of the information from my district. Um, and I, I just want to say something, um, since this is my opportunity to, to, to speak, to say something in conclusion. I'll go back, as we all will, to our, to our districts. And I will try to continue to work within the parameters and the limitations and the opportunities uh, that we have. And I'll continue to try to push the boundaries. And I will continue, as many other attorneys will, to try to make things better. And I'm very, very grateful to be able to address all of you who are looking at the much bigger picture with the much bigger opportunity to make much grander uh, changes. Um, I was uh, somebody. Mr. McBride, I guess he's not here anymore. He spoke about his nine-year-old son. My son's 18, and he is um, just is about to graduate from high school. And as a gift, my parents gave him a trip to see his favorite London football team, the Tottenham. I'm going to get it wrong. The Tottenham Hotspur team. And um, and so I went along, and it was very exciting, and we learned a lot. And I, of course, I tried to quiz him on on all the trivia. And it turns out that the team motto for Tottenham is to dare is to do. And it's all over the stadium, and it's all over the uniforms, and it's all over the signs on the streets in Tottenham about what this team can do. And there must be something right about it, because they beat the Norwich Canaries 3 to nil. So, so I, um, I, you know, it's been a couple of weeks now, but I still have that phrase in my mind, and I want to try to leave it with you also, which is I, I was so intrigued, I was so edified, I was so inspired by what Judge Gleason said about fundamental change uh, that's necessary. And so to dare is to do. And I, I hope that all of us and all of your sessions can, can lead to something really positive getting done. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Foster, you're going to be next. All right. Good afternoon. Thanks for inviting me. I've been a panel attorney in Charlotte in the Western District of North Carolina for 20 years. I arrived there after having uh, about 15 years of practice experience. I uh, got on the CJ panel instantly because there were no criteria, no standards. You just had to be alive, breathing, and admitted to practice. So I got on the list and, and took a lot of cases. And then about six years ago, I became the panel representative, which I still am. And about five years ago, I became a member of the board of directors of our community defenders organization. <coughs> and I'm still on that uh, board as well. Um, in our district, we have had the, since the federal, since the community defenders were formed 10 years ago, that's when they took over administration of the CJA panel. Prior to that, it was done uh, by a couple of clerks in the, in the uh, clerk's office. One, each of them worked for the two magistrates, and they just sort of farmed out cases, making phone calls to whoever they could find, and it's sort of a hit and miss thing. Uh, since the community defenders organization has been in place, they've done a, done a very good job of of uh, equally doling out the cases, avoiding conflicts, and providing a lot of uh, assistance to the panel members. And then, and this gets more difficult in the multi-defendant cases, and I think they've done a very good job also of making sure that everybody gets a qualified lawyer. Uh, obviously, the federal defender is going to only take the first one of the defendants. They've usually taken the most, the one who looks like they're the supposed kingpin or the one with the most evidence or the one with the most complexity involved, and then tried to find you know, qualified lawyers for each of the other defendants. I would say that uh, they do go to the next person on the list, except in some instances the cases are highly complex and they need to find somebody who's adequately experienced to give the case to. Um, as far as uh, <coughs> Discovery in the multi-defendant cases, that, that's always been tricky. Uh, we've made some good use recently of the dis, uh, discovery coordinating attorneys. Uh, the one we use for some reason is, is out on the West Coast. We're in Charlotte, but it's, he's out in Seattle, Russ Aoki and his firm. But they've been doing a great job of uh, taking a bunch of disparate discovery in various different electronic formats. Uh, which many, most of which is unsearchable, putting it together uh, so that you can access it in one place, it's searchable, and all the different individual defense attorneys can form their own, uh, sort of record their own search and what they're doing, and it's separate from what the other co-defendants' attorneys are doing. 
So I'm assuming this is a, uh, a great efficiency and a cost saver rather than have each attorney individually slogging away trying to figure out how to, how to get through all this stuff. Um, you know, and something else that seems to appear a lot is we get discovery <coughs> from the U.S. Attorney's Office on disks, which is uh, sometimes a lot of it is single page PDFs, which you have to open individually, look at, close, open the next one. And so if there was an effort underfoot to get the U.S. Attorney's Office to combine these into large PDFs that we could then make searchable, I think that would save a lot of time and money, save attorney time on reviewing discovery, and it would be very helpful. Um, in our district, uh, we've had an increase. It used to be that we had no criteria for panel attorneys, and then uh, the judges finally instituted a uh, set of guidelines, I believe about seven or eight years ago, a uh, set of criteria that you have to uh, satisfy in order to be uh, on the panel. So what they did is they took everybody who'd previously been on this panel that had about 200 people for the Western District, which includes Charlotte, Asheville, and Statesville, and basically started over. Everybody had to reapply, and you had to have certain things in your uh, resume to, to qualify. A lot of people didn't, didn't uh, apply who had already actually been on it. Uh, the, the list got uh, smaller, and we've, we've modified the qualifications once or twice. So it's, we're in the process of, of hopefully creating a better panel of CJA attorneys than, than, what it, than what it once was. There's a panel selection committee that takes applications once a year, and the, group, the panel attorneys are broken down into three groups. Uh, so they come up for reconsideration the, the three-year term. So every three years you have to reapply. And so that seems to be making progress in getting a better qualified uh, panel of attorneys to handle the cases. Um, so that's what I have to say at this point. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Foster. Judge? As I said, you get the last word. Oh, my goodness. That's not necessarily <laughs> a word. good thing after two days of hard work, and we can open that so some light gets in here so you won't <laughs> think it's so late. But thank you for inviting me. You know, uh, I haven't been able to hear what everyone has said, but I know that we've, you've had two judges from our district, Judge Skoll and Judge Graham, who are very experienced. So there's no sense repeating a lot of the things that I suspect they have said with their experience. One a much newer judge than the other, and both of them being uh, practicing criminal defense lawyers. My perspective is, as Mr. Khan has said, because he's tried cases in front of me, so I, I do have uh, the perspective of being a judge for a long time, 25 years, and sometimes when you're a judge for so long, you do need a reminder of what it was like to practice law. It is true, and some need the reminder more often than others, I confess. Before that, I was also uh, a state judge. So when you're, you compare federal court with state court, you're, you're very happy to be here, no matter what the complaints are, because there's always someone who is worse off than you are, whether it's a judge or even a private lawyer. And then uh, I was also an assistant federal public defender. We've come a long way since the time when I started uh, practicing, when the, I think I put that in my two-page submission, where the rate was $20 an hour for out of court. Uh, I know it was a long time ago, but still, I'm not eligible to go senior, so it wasn't that long. And, <laughs> and I still remember what became a future colleague of mine cutting the fee that was for $120, because it was a suppression hearing. I still remember. And he chopped it to $100. Now, uh, so I understand, I assume later on, I figured, I'm talking about you know, 30 years later, that it was obviously an automatic, an automatic uh, cut. So, I, I still remember, I haven't forgotten that. We've come a long way when now the rate is $129, $128, but there's still, there's still some issues. I would like to divide the concerns in three parts. Federal defenders, CJA panel, and then the perhaps the more difficult one, the judicial involvement. 
federal defender is easy, I think, uh, certainly in our district, and I think even in most districts, the ones that have it. I remember being on the Defender Services Committee for six years, and the Southern District of Georgia always came up. Uh, and that's an issue. I think we can have some changes with that. You can have national standards like that. for, And you have to figure out whether it's worth having uh, community defenders organizations versus federal public defender. I think you can do that nationally. What I don't think you can do is eliminate the geographic differences that we have in America. I mean, we have that with sentencing. We have that with maybe we have a blue states and red states. We have blue districts and red districts, and maybe blue judges and red judges. I don't know. And I think uh, most judges, I think, are going to be fair, and most judges are susceptible to the suggestions that you all will have. There might be some who won't. And I don't think a, a committee can really change that minute portion of the judges. But with federal defenders, they're great. We've had a, a great office here in the Southern District. Uh, Judge Williams was the federal defender before that. Michael Caruso does a great job. Their main problem is to make sure they have enough funding to survive. I do think that we shouldn't look at things with the, the bad view of the sequestration. I think that was an exception, and we shouldn't relive that over and over. Uh, because if we do that, I don't think we accomplish anything. Uh, as long as they have their funding, they decide when they need to use experts. And you know what happens? When it's the money that's in your budget, you think about the cost when it's not your budget, and then the tendency might be to ask for, for more experts. They get paid a lot. When I was an assistant federal public defender, uh, I was the second highest paid assistant federal public defender for $24,000. And I was the second longest serving a year and a half. We've come a long way. The federal public defender's office now is great. I think they pay them uh, a good salary, and that's what we need to do. Same thing with the CJA panel, but there's a little difference with the CJA panel, in my view. The CJA panel, we have here in our district, they're lawyers. You wouldn't know the difference whether they were privately retained or court appointed. They're the same lawyers in our district, and they do the same type of work. And, and I think we have to remember that the right to be appointed is really the defendant's right, not the lawyer's. Now here in our district, the lawyers want to do it. The lawyers want to do it, I think, for different reasons. One of them is public service. There's a little bit of that. I know when I was younger, there was a little dual motivation. You know, if you're before the judges and you do a good job, you know, they start trusting you. Maybe you can even get more cases done, you know, through reputation. So uh, I, I, I think we ought to focus on the right of the defendant. The lawyer should be treated with respect, but that doesn't necessarily mean we approve everything that they ask for. One thing that we do in this district that I think I've heard from the lawyers that they appreciate, we have what we did for you all yesterday. We do it at other times. We have awards. We invite them. When, during sequestration, we use our bench and bar fund that every district has. Every district has a fairly big bench and bar fund from the pro Beach emotions and all of that. And we helped them with their seminar when they weren't getting the money. And I think that goes with the respect. I think the lawyers don't just want the money, they want respect. And I think uh, that, would, that would help. The last thing I'll say before my, my time, time runs out is uh, the judicial involvement. And, and that's a little bit more difficult. And I, I mentioned in the letter, so I don't want to repeat myself. Uh, we all mentioned Judge Gleason, who's a great guy. And I was looking last night, I was reading the, the Champion, you know, the National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers. I get it. I imagine every judge gets it, but I don't know. Maybe I'm on a special list. I doubt it. But the quote for Judge Gleason when he got an award was, uh, the federal indigent defense system is the crown jewel. We have a great deal to be proud of in the federal system. I think our problem is 
majorly in the state system. And we, we ought not to forget that. It doesn't mean we don't have problems, and he's discussed them as he's leaving the bench, but I think we ought to be more positive about it. And I think it would be a mistake to divorce the judicial involvement just because there's some complaints about one or few judges. There's really not much that you can do once a judge has been appointed and confirmed. I don't know what you could do. And I think it would be a mistake to create uh, a, another bureaucracy that would review vouchers, another bureaucracy that uh, would review the experts' costs. First, it would cost money. That could go to the lawyers or for indigent defense. More importantly, who would appoint that? Would it be the judges? So if the judges, I mean, the, the Court of Appeals appoints a federal public defender. We as judges, as I mentioned in my letter, deal with attorney's fees all the time in civil cases when it involves private money in class actions and Fair Labor Standard Act cases and civil rights cases. And if we trust the, the judges to do that in those cases, I think we should trust them to do it with taxpayer money. That's not to say that we cannot be educated. Just sitting here, I've learned uh, a lot. And it's, it's a little bit sad, and I know that it happens in other places, not here. But I, I think we have to focus on what actually can be done uh, and, and I, in balancing the national standards that you should set and the geographic differences that we have circuit by circuit. And you know, rather than, than repeating what some of my colleagues have said, you know, I'll respond to any questions. And I did it in less time, right? I didn't hear it. I actually gave you some extra time. Oh, you did. Ah. Yeah. Right. Deference to my former chief. Oh, okay. He tried a death penalty case in front of me and did a great job. Judge Fisher, would you like to begin our questioning? Yes, thank you very much. And thank you all for being with us and for, for taking the time and to, pro, to provide the written testimony as well. I want to start with Mr. Beauvais. And we've been encouraged and urged uh, by various sources not to come up with a one-size-fits-all uh, recommendation or solution. But I do want to ask for whatever other uh, thoughts you might have about uh, either an FPDO or a CDO in your district. And thank you for providing the answer to my first question. You said you have about 600 uh, indictments per year and uh, 45 were uh, multiple defendant cases. So let's, let's just even take 500 as the number that any uh, FPDO would would handle. That seems to me to be a sufficient number, and and the information you gave about the number of AUSAs uh, is also would indicate that. You indicated that there was a two-year experience with an FPDO that wasn't good. Do you know anything more about that that you are willing to tell us or can tell us <laughs> that might help overcome any reluctance by your district, or do you have a, a, an approach that could be taken with your judges to try to move further in the direction of getting one of those kinds of entities? Your Honor, um, it's my understanding that that experience happened back in the early 80s. I don't really know when. I got to the district in 92, so I had no personal knowledge. It's my understanding that they did hire an individual uh, as a public defender. Um, I think it went south in a hurry. I don't believe they hired any assistant public defenders. And it lasted, it may even have been less than 18 months. That was just my best information from talking to lawyers that, that were around. My senior partner was around back then uh, at the time. Um, I, I think, and, and I'm hopeful that there is a change of foot because we have had a significant change in our judiciary uh, over the last several years. We have two new magistrates we recently lost uh, one of the judges who was around during that experience and then simply was unapproachable on the subject. Uh, we do have two relatively new district judges who I don't believe are philosophically opposed to the 
a federal public or community defender organization. <coughs> so that's why I'm, I'm somewhat hopeful that we can move in, in, in that direction over the next several years. I'd like to see it sooner rather than later, um, but I, I think we're moving that way. And you mentioned with regard to vouchers that you thought perhaps the issues were uh, either more related to the individual judge or the individual attorney in that maybe better descriptions and the reputations of the attorneys were relevant. Let's talk about these. The attorneys with excellent reputations, and we've, we've heard from Ms. Copeland and, and you're here. Uh, do you have a core group of well-respected attorneys that you think could go to the judges or could do something along the lines of organizing or improving the state of affairs with regard to even selecting better people for your panel? I believe our chief judge is approachable on that issue, and I think there is a, a group of attorneys that, uh, you know, along that serve on our federal district court advisory committee, uh, and also some other, others that are not necessarily on the committee that um, could approach the judge and open up discussions in that regard. Thank you, Mr. Shaftnet. You you indicate a concern, and I think a number of panels have this concern about, uh, in your words, the old white male. Uh, panel and it's it's aging out and you, you talked about an emphasis on recruiting younger members and minorities how are you doing that is it being at all successful you indicated that recent graduates aren't is interested in criminal law and how does that all uh, work into the the rate what reputation perhaps there is for not being able to get uh, valid compensation or, or experts and those other things we've been talking about. Well, Judge Fisher, I guess the people that are on my panel, and, and again, I'm talking about district-wide, but also the Gainesville Division, saw the same movie I saw in 62, and they're very devoted to the concept of indigent representation. Uh, when I started, it was $20 an hour for out-of-court time. Uh, adjusted for inflation, it was inadequate. Then $129 in 2016 adjusted for inflation is woefully inadequate today. Uh, I'm an adjunct professor at the University of Florida Law School. I try to recruit as many minority students. I find out where they're going and once they graduate, do they have any interest whatsoever in, in criminal defense? Would they be interested in going into federal court? What I find are that unfortunately minorities in particular, uh, African Americans, women, are almost uniformly not interested in going into federal court for any reason. Um, they're being recruited heavily by major law firms to do PI work. Uh, they have a huge student debt load that they have to service when they get out of school. They're not able to get out debt free like I was able to and, and take cases at $20 an hour or $129 an hour. And so as a result, what we have on the Gainesville panel are, the good news is we have an extremely large number of very experienced lawyers. Uh, the other good news is that we don't have that many border cases, and so uh, most of our clients are either white or African-American males. Uh, we don't have the diversity of clientele, but we also don't have the diversity of representation. We don't have any Spanish-speaking lawyers on our panel. We have no Latinas on our panel. We have no African-Americans on our panel. I have gone to Federal Bar Association meetings, National Lawyer Guild meetings, uh, you know, Young Lawyer Division meetings. There's simply it's a combination of a fear factor in going into federal court and, quite frankly, the, the abysmal compensation level. And they've heard horror stories, much the same as what the committee has heard uh, about not only getting paid, but getting the resources necessary to adequately defend a, a federal criminal case. And quite frankly, most of them are just not interested in starting their legal careers in that fashion. I think the uh, even if we applied what's allowed by statute, the rate would only be between 145 and 150. Would that be enough, or do you think it, we, we need to? You, you know, Judge Fisher, I think, no, it wouldn't be enough, but it would indicate a level of respect. Uh, right now, the congressionally authorized level just never seems to be met. And there's always a reason for it. It's either sequestration or, you know, some kind of budget crisis du jour. And the panel lawyers are very devoted to the defender system. We've taken cuts. We've deferred payments. 
because we believe in the federal public defender system. We want it to flourish. And as panel lawyers, most of the people on my panel have a robust privately retained criminal practice. That's not the case in other districts. And when I go to DSAG meetings, some of my other DSAG uh, people from, say, the Ninth Circuit and other places have a, a, a clientele that, that is basically, a, a number of them do get a, a, a sizable amount of their income from panel work. That's not the case in my district. And so we, we have made the sacrifices, but quite candidly, it's a matter of respect. I think that uh, at, at the end of the day, $145 is not enough, but I would much rather sell that to a new lawyer and say, yes, it's only $145, but it's going to be adjusted for inflation, and we're going to get more money, and we have the, you know, the ability to get the resources. One of the other things that I wanted to mention, because I think it is, it's very critical, is I am very concerned about the independence issue as it relates to the topic that I just spoke of, and, and for this reason. In the state of Florida, I think Judge Moreno just mentioned it, we have an abysmal system of conflict representation that didn't exist before Governor Scott decided to save money and create what's called a conflicts office. And so right now, when the state public defender withdraws, it doesn't go to a, a cadre of very seasoned, well-qualified, vetted lawyers. It goes to a, an office of conflict representation. They are more underfunded than the public defender. They are, their caseloads are, are huge and it's just a very bad system. My concern, if we separate from the judiciary, is this, that we'll be put on an island and that we'll be going to Congress trying to get money and trying to get lobby for things that at least now we have the, the imprimatur of the, of the judiciary to help us. And so whatever model the committee comes up with, I certainly don't want to be in a situation where we lose what we struggled so hard to get, and that is these incremental increases in the rate. I think the rate is, is abysmal, but more importantly, we need to raise the caps, because that's really what is driving a lot of this problem that we're experiencing with, with vouchers and experts. Thanks very much. One brief question for Mr. Foster. Uh, we heard yesterday, if I understood the judge correctly, about a concern with a community defender office and the community defender board members perhaps having conflicts when they were representing a co-defendant and all as a CJA lawyer and but were also on the community defender board and the community defender is do you perceive that in your district or is that a concern that comes up I never perceived it, and I don't think any other members of our board uh, perceived it until recently in the last half a year that that issue was presented, and we all started thinking, well, gosh, you know, technically that, that sounds like a conflict, but in, in practice, uh, I never saw it. I mean, I've handled cases where the federal offenders are representing uh, someone who's maybe testifying as my client and vice versa, and it never even occurred to me and I've never heard it occurring to other members to try to pull rank and say, hey, you know, you shouldn't be doing this because I'm on the committee that oversees your office. So um, I haven't seen that played out in, in real life as being a problem. But if you, you know, sit down and look at it on paper, I, I suppose it, could, it can be viewed as a conflict. Yeah. Judge Walton, you're up. Ms. Burrell, we, we, we've heard two different versions of what is taking place uh, in Puerto Rico. And it's, it's, I mean, we have to try and get to what actually is taking place there. And when we have those two diff different versions, how do we reconcile them? How do we get to what actually the situation is? I'm not this, you know, this discarding what you say. I was here, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I was here. I, I'm aware yeah. of that. How do we resolve that, that conflict? Certain numbers speak for themselves. The number of, uh, speaking about experts, uh, the number of times people, in, in cases that people actually ask for experts, I think you can extrapolate from that, and that's just a number that will speak for itself. The number of times experts get denied, it's a number that will speak for itself. The number, uh, the amount of money, I, I know that the federal public defender from our district cited some statistic, a, a national average concerning third party providers, <coughs> and, and our average, that number 
those numbers, I think you can learn from those numbers and it's, it's not somebody's um, recollection, whether it's mine or the chief judge's or, or anybody's recollection about the way, uh, the way things um, are. So I, I think with respect to experts and third party service providers, there's objective, um, if, if you do want to get to the bottom of it and, 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 and not simply jump right to the fact that we need to be encouraged to be using third, that, that I mean, it's true in civil cases, it's true in high school, you get out of things, the more you put into something, the more you get out of something. And so I, I, um, I, I think we could not get to the bottom of it and just skip over to more encouraging uh, of, of, that, of that kind of, of use of um, providers, but if you wanted to, I think there's some objective numbers that could speak for themselves. With respect to um, with respect to uh, vouchers and voucher cutting, I was here, and I and I and I was uh, well. Actually, I shouldn't say that because I was part of it. I was on I ninety five, and I was listening to uh, the the feed, and part of it I was here, and I heard a whole bunch of numbers that I have never been um, exposed to. Uh, I have asked, and I have, and and maybe it's not for me to have those numbers as a, as a panel attorney, as a member of the, of the committee, maybe it's not, but, but I, I've never heard those numbers before. I've heard other numbers from other months, from other time periods, and I went and I, I, and I, I say this, it's not gonna sound like that, but I say it with respect, I, I just don't trust those numbers. I think if you wanted to, I think you'd have to do a, I think you'd have to set an objective set, an objective way of looking into the number of vouchers filed, the uh, number of cuts by the clerk's office, the number of cuts by the judge, um, judges, and um, I think it would be a case-by-case case, um, set of set of statistics. That again, I wonder if there's a, I wonder if there's a need to actually get to the bottom of it, or if we should just kind of accept the third thing that I want to say, which is that there's there's a. There's many issues at, at the bottom of this. There's many fundamental issues, but one of them is just a fundamental issue of attitude. And, and I, I don't, I think that having, you having listened to all the people you've listened to, the public defender, the chief judge, the attorney that spoke in the second panel, me now, um, I think you can conclude that it's just a, a, a matter of perspective and a matter of, um, a matter of attitude. Um, when I worked at the Public Defender's Office, which was from 1990 to 1993, Chief Judge Delgado was the first federal public defender. She was my supervisor, and she was one of three people that most influenced my career as a defense attorney, one of three mentors, maybe even the top of, of the three. And one of the reasons why I so admired and admire her, and one of the reasons why I learned so much is because I can still see it now. Every single file, and at that time, our office was not getting complicated cases. There was a lot of um, illegal entry, not even re-entry. Um, just, it wasn't that. No case was that complex, but, but, or very few cases were that complex, but every single one of her files was at least three inches, four inches, you know, two files, accordion files for the most basic of misdemeanor pleas and sentences on the same day. I mean, I learned how to find out about a person's background. I learned, how, and I think I learned that, and I think she was able to do that because of the luxury, because, not only say luxury, because I think it's a, <coughs> it's a little less than a luxury, I think it's a need, because of what everybody that's ever worked in a public defender's office or still does knows, which is that you can, you can, you have the, you can, deal with this case the way it needs to be dealt with. You can take the steps you need to take. You can defend your client. You can get to know your client. You can pursue every avenue that needs to be pursued. You can do what it, Atticus did to represent um, his clients. And um, I think, I mean, to finish that novel, um, where you stand obviously depends upon where you sit and what you, have responsibility for and, and it, when you're a public defender is one thing and what you have, what you think you have responsibility for in terms of managing a very busy district is another thing. But I think that, that um, that's, that's just, we, the court, the clerk's office, the people that, make, that have the power right now do not look at 
what criminal defense attorneys do, the same way that people sitting in public defender's office, this is people sitting here uh, at this table look at, and that's what we need to do to get to the bottom of, of what, we, we need to find a way locally in my district and nationally to change that attitude. Thank, thank, thank you. Um, Judge Marino, basically everybody who spoke about how the program operates here in this district had uniform praise uh, for how the CJA program operates. And I think you and your colleagues would be com commended uh, for that. But nonetheless, we still heard from several that they still think that there is a problem of independence. And they say, well, nobody supervises the U.S. Attorney's Office and tells them when they can return attain a, a, an expert and what things they can do in order to uh, prepare and present their case, but yet, you feel like uh, the court system has to control how we operate in, in the representation of people in the protection of their Sixth Amendment rights. So if you were writing this report, how would you reconcile uh, that dichotomy? Because the system seems to work well, but nonetheless there are people who do the defense work who nonetheless feel that uh, there's not sufficient independence. Well, I think it's a question of perception. Uh, I find that the lawyers who come before us are very independent. Just because you appoint a lawyer doesn't mean you're going to control them, trust me. We can control uh, the cost, though. And I, I think the, uh, the view that a panel attorney or even the federal defender is going to get the same amount of money as the Department of Justice is just not realistic. I understand, and I think the only way to, uh, to achieve some equity would be with the Office of the Federal Public Defender. You could increase their salaries, provide enough money for them, and then they control their own budget regarding the experts. Once they have the money, they can decide within certain parameters what to do. The panel attorneys is a separate issue. But with the federal defenders, that they're, they're, I think they're very independent. Yes, they're under the uh, rubrics of the courts, but if it weren't for that, they couldn't get what they want from Congress, I'm pretty certain. Certainly not in this climate. I mean, it's a lot easier for the Department of Justice to get money than if someone who were to argue on behalf of, say, the Federal Public Defender's Office. The panel attorneys, I think, are in a separate situation. One thing that I think could be done by the committee is a matter of <coughs> discovery or experts. And you can shift the burden to the government. In other words, judges could order whenever there are issues on discovery and the government would say, no, we're, we're, we're not going to pay for all of this. I think a judge has the authority to order, hey, you invited us to this party, you made the indictment, through the grand jury, that means you're going to have to provide discovery to everybody and not charge the courts, basically, if they're panel attorneys or the federal defender's office. That would be one way to make things more balanced. As far as perception, uh, I know what we did, and I see that Michael Caruso's here. When he was sworn in as a federal public defender, we gave him the same uh, party and, and oath as we did when Willie Ferrer, who also testified before you, was sworn in by, uh, by uh, Attorney General Holder when he came down. There are things like that that can be done, and it's a change of culture that, that doesn't really involve uh, too much cash. But there's always going to be a little bit of an antagonistic, hey, they get more money. They're always going to get more money. The Department of Justice is always going to get more money than Defender Services. I think it's a reality. The question is, how do we approach that? Uh, I mean, I don't know what else to say except that. You guys have a difficult job. I, I think uh, the more difficult, what, what troubles me is the differences with judges. I've learned a lot here, and, and that's, that's, that's almost impossible to change. Uh, and, I mean, judges are different, right? And uh, even within the same district, there's some judges who routinely cut vouchers just automatically. 
There are others who don't care. I think most judges would rather not even participate in this. They rather, uh, if you were to take a poll, I would say it would be in the 90s. They would rather not participate in this penny thing. That's why sometimes district judges send it to the magistrate. That's why the chief circuit judge appoint someone to rotate, and I'm sure it's not one of these things that you wish you go for. Uh, it, it, it is a, a tough thing, but it's still taxpayers' money, and I think we have an obligation to do some supervision. I think it's a question more of educating, and maybe the fault is us as judges and not talking to our colleagues, and maybe us as judges not being open enough to the lawyers to tell you, this is what it's like. You've forgotten what it was like to practice law. Thank you. Catherine. Moreno. Thank you. Judge Moreno, I just want to follow up on that. I should have been in an earlier panel and continue my case. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> I hear what you're saying about its judges, and you say something that a number of judges have said to us before, and that is that once you get sworn in and put the robe on, one, you may forget what it's like to have been a lawyer if anyone was ever a criminal defense lawyer, I know you were, but if any of them were, and two, that no one can tell you what to do anymore. You're an Article Three judge. No one's gonna tell you what to do. And that's the issue. The issue is, is that you can tell judges, for, I'll give you an example, the Judiciary Guide. A few years ago, a number of people, including Judge Gleason, fought to have language placed in the Judiciary Guide that if, you were, if a judge was going to cut a voucher, that the judge had to inform the lawyer and give him an opportunity to be heard. Opportunity Remember, to be heard. I was on the committee when that occurred. And, and we appreciate that. But unfortunately, that is, it's like, hey, you could do this or you can not do this. It's in the guide, but no one does anything about the fact that judges don't do it. Sub judges do. Probably more judges don't. But, and, the, and so what happens is it's meaningless in the districts in which the judges don't abide by that, even though it's in the guide, even though it was hard fought to get it there. So what we come back to is the issue of judicial involvement. If, in fact, you cannot tell a Title III judge what to do because they're going to choose to do what they want to do, or and what if, they think is right. Or what they think is right. And if, in fact, that means that they not only don't give notice if they're going to cut, but that they may cut not because they don't think the work was done, but they may cut because this is just too much to pay for that kind of case. We just don't pay that much. We can't afford that much. Whatever it is, and that's certainly a rationale that's given by many judges when they cut vouchers. If that's true, why should we not take it out of the hands of the judges and put the management of the panel, the payment of the vouchers, somewhere else? Well, first of all, you have to decide where do you put it? Agree. Who gets the job of overseeing that? A former private practitioner, a former panel member who knows the lawyers, an individual who doesn't know what happened in the case. Who knows more about the case but the lawyers who tried it and the judge who oversees it? the judge who oversaw it. That, the judge is the one who knows, not the most, but he certainly knows more than a bureaucrat who would be overseeing it, right? That's the problem. So that bureaucrat would have to get information from the judge. How does he know that, for example, the few times I've cut have been in multiple defendant cases. You have several lawyers. One lawyer has really been the lead lawyer, the one who files the motions, the one who knows what's going on, and she does a great job. There are other lawyers, and they're good lawyers, but they've been going along with it. You get the vouchers, and the lead lawyer, maybe uh, he's, he's not as, as efficient in the voucher, but asks for $8,000. And the non-lead lawyer asks for $10,000. Well, yeah. I say that, that's not right, because I know who filed the motions, I know who made the argument, I know who was lead, it's just not fair to do that. Now how would a third person who would become a bureaucrat, who would be paid a salary, who would need a staff, who would need an office, decide that 
in, especially in a big district where you have hundreds, thousands of cases. Uh, it is true that most judges do not read every day the guide that is done by the administrative office of the courts. It's not something that we relish reading. We want to do what we think is fair. The problem, of course, is there are different views of what is, of what is fair. But I don't think you can take it away from the judiciary, particularly when the judiciary is the one that is obtaining the money from Congress. That's the problem. It's almost like uh, you know, your children, when they say, hey, we want to be totally independent. All children always want to be independent when they're 18 and 19. And then they say, hey, can we have some money? Can we borrow the car? If you're going to have the money that the courts have obtained for you, we have an obligation, even though we don't like doing it, to oversee the money that the taxpayers are, are paying for. And I think defenders are better off with the judges supporting them. Putting aside sequestration, which I think was an exception, you're much better off. Be careful what you ask for, because if you're alone and totally independent in getting a budget from Congress, you're going to need the lobbyists, you're going to need, you know, a lot of things. I know that many judges and many individuals, the administrative office of the courts is not that popular. They're, they're, they're more popular than GSA, for example, but, <laughs> but they're but that, just about anybody is. But, <laughs> They yes. do a good job. They were very helpful in getting the rate increase. And I know it's not super, I know. But if it weren't for them, they're the ones who constantly are talking to the staffers in Congress. It's not just the senators or the congressmen. A lot of things are done by staff. Who would be doing that for the federal defenders? It takes a lot more than writing a good editorial or an article in the champion to get something done. Someone has to be there in Washington pushing it. That's what my fear is. If you go at it alone and you have your own person, and then you got to get the money too, and then what's going to happen? Well, I think that's the question though, isn't it? I mean, we're looking at not just the independence, but we're looking at the structure. And is there a possibility of staying within the judiciary and having a different structure as far as who, uh, who manages the panel. So and I think that's one of the things. And you get the car. See, that's, that's how it works with my son. <laughs> <laughs> there's probably more love. I mean, we, I like the lawyers, but there's probably more love between you and your son <laughs> than some of the lawyers. But seriously, it is a difficult thing. But I think, other than the respect issues, which I think are very important. And, uh, and not superficial. They just don't cost as much money. Um, I, I do think that um, the lawyers are independent. The lawyers <coughs> do what they want. I mean, I, I don't want to go back to the days Atticus Finch didn't get paid anything for doing what he did, all right? And that was terrible and horrible. And what happens in state court, if, uh, Florida is one of the best. When you read at some of the other uh, state is terrible even in death penalty cases and that's still a minority but you know I don't want to just be the the optimist but I think we're not as even Judge Gleason who's a strong advocate for the defender services thinks that we're, we're a pretty good system with some improvement I cannot believe you know I remember because he told me he was going to talk about uh, something with when the defender services was let me, let me call it downgraded. Demoted. Demoted, you know, whatever <laughs> the word was. You know, all of that is bureaucratic talk that is really not, in my view, significant to the lawyers in the front line. Whether the, the, the head of the Defender Services gets the office in this floor and gets this and that. that, those are the fights that happen among the bureaucrats that really do not impact the lawyer, what the lawyer wants is, give me the money so I can defend this case, give me compensation for this, and I cannot see how creating a new bureaucracy is gonna help the lawyer. They're gonna have the fights. I'm kind of astounded that the clerk's office in some district is the one that does the, the, the 
I mean, they do the computation here, and we had, until she retired, she was wonderful because she would always, you know, recompute. These lawyers don't even know how to add or subtract. She would always say, you're not asking enough, you don't know how to add in our district. But the judges are the ones who decide whether we approve it or not, and the circuit court decides whether it should be access, which I think is the, the major thing, is, is there access. This case, sometimes, I, I speak with some of my colleagues and I convince them, they say, hey, this was a plea. How can someone ask for an excess? And I say, well, think about it. What kind of a case is Is it a Medicare fraud? Well, they had to go through thousands of documents. Yeah, you didn't see them. You saw them at the guilty plea, but it was a lot of work. That's really education <clears throat> within our conferences, during our seminars. That's what we have to do. But I think it would be a serious mistake it Just takes me, away work, but it would be a mistake. Let me exercise Chair's prerogative. I'm going to interrupt and ask you a question since, uh, since you're talking about this subject, which is it's always seemed to me a very, very curious model to have the highest value employees of an organization involved in what's basically accounting and bill paying. You know, in the DOD, you don't have the Joint Chiefs of Staff deciding whether or not to pay a bill that a contractor submitted. And so, you know, even if you accept that it's going to remain within the judiciary, and the judiciary employees will look at bills and decide, you know, whether they are, you know, following appropriate guidelines, why is it the judges, why does it need to be the judges on the cases who are, that the lawyers are actually appearing before that needs to sign off on those bills? Why would They're we the do that? They're the ones who know. The bureaucrat sitting someplace do not know. I know that when you came before me and entered a guilty plea and spent only the 20 minutes, 15 minutes that it takes me to take your guilty plea, you still deserve $10,000 because you, of the documents. But the you just bureaucrat would be like, like that clerk in Puerto Rico who's just going to do plus and minus, and, and that's what's going to happen. You're going to have guidelines, and, and then it's just going to be numbers. But the problem is you got to have a good judge who knows about the case and who remembers what it's like to be a trial lawyer. Well, and that we have no influence over. Well, but Judge, you, you just made a point that I think is really relevant to this. You, you're, you're the judge, you're the judge on the case, but you don't know when I've just haven't filed the motions and I've sort of gone along in the wake of the lead lawyer. You don't know that I'm the lawyer who had the most difficult client who required me to run to ground a thousand different issues and meet with him 18 different times. So if I'm going to cut your voucher, you tell me. But I can explain that to, to the bureaucrat, too. No, but you know, the who's, what is the bureaucrat's background? Well, with a the, former lawyer? Got to be. A former lawyer who What's did that. What's a former lawyer? Huh? <laughs> <laughs> former, someone former with some. Former panel lawyer, who appoints them? Well, th those are all Judges questions. Judges are the director. See, you're those creating are... something that is unnecessary. What you need is more money and more respect from us, not another bureaucracy. So, Judge, I'm going to delve into one other question with you, and then I'm going to turn it over to Chip because I'm eating into his time. You know, one of the things that you've talked about, you talked about this district, and of course I practiced in this district, so I, I know a lot about it. And, um, you know, it's sort of an exceptional district. It's exceptional in terms of the quality of the panel. It's exceptional in terms of the independence uh, and, and, and the leeway that the judges give the panel lawyers. It's exceptional in the hands-off approach of the 11th Circuit to the defender offices. And you know, because you've heard some of the stories and you heard even more of them when you were on defender services, that, that the rest of the country, many parts of the country, are not like that. Um, and, you know, we can... Maybe the solution is to spread the good word from the 11th Circuit instead of creating a bureaucracy. I wouldn't want to spread know. everything from the 11th Circuit. <laughs> <laughs> but but how, do we, how do we deal with that, that we've got parts of the country that are, uh, are really in very bad shape? And as you said, when Article Three judges are in charge, you know, you can't, as you put it, you can't say anything to an Article Three judge. No, I didn't so say what you do we do? Say anything, you but you couldn't tell them what to do. But you okay, can still we can't talk. tell them what to do, Dialogue no matter no matter how bad what they're doing is. <laughs> so, so how do we deal with that? 
Can, can I just, I mean, I know I'm out of turn, but let me give you an example, Judge Moreno. I'm in the Western District of Texas. Every district is required to have a CJA plan. I'm, I'm in a district where in Austin, Texas, there is no CJA plan. Okay, they won't have a plan, they refuse to have a plan, and nobody can tell them what to do. And so I think the dilemma of the committee, and I think Ruben's question is, if we're gonna make a recommendation that the judges stay in charge, how do we hold judges accountable who aren't like the, the good judges who care and are going to follow rules like or, or recommendations like give us a give us an excuse a reason why you cut the voucher. I think that's our question. I would work through the circuit councils. The circuit councils are the ones who really have power in the judiciary. The chief judge of every circuit and the councils. And I think uh, recommending to them, you know, a circuit council could go as far as saying, I don't know whether they would, and I certainly cannot speak for anybody. I'm only speaking for myself. I'm not speaking for the dis even for this district and then definitely for any committee that I may be a member of. I'm speaking for myself, but the circuit councils. That way you're balancing the geographic differences that we have in America and at the same time. So the eleventh circuit council could say, well let's look at the Southern District of Georgia. Right now there have been some changes. Some judges have left. Some judges have come aboard. I think we can convince them. And it's a lot easier for a circuit court judge to convince a district court judge than it is for a lawyer to convince a district court judge. That's what I would do. I would talk, involve judges like Judge Prado, judges from the circuit court who have the power and the influence not to dictate, but to convince them this is the right thing to do. Hey, Fred, this is the right thing to do in your district. The federal public defender should be the head, the, the administrator of the panel, so we have qualified people. We should have a panel, or, or we should have a federal defender's office. I think that's the only way you're going to have change. I think it would be a terrible mistake to create a new bureaucracy, but I'm generally against uh, new bureaucracies, maybe because I had to deal with them for seven years as chief, and I, I just don't think it's something that's worthwhile the, 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 on the cost-benefit analysis. Judge Marina, I, I share some of your, well, most of your concerns, but we have heard that the problem rests with the top of the uh, totem pole. The way the chief circuit judges. That, that, that there are problems with some of the, of the chief Judges of the circuits that that, that are the real problem. Well, so we so we know, can't. I'm really... not privy to that, and I'm kind of <laughs> glad that I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, so nice to have your own courtroom and not have yeah. to share. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, I always I and I've said this before. Uh, federal uh, district judges are like Scottish feudal lords. They only get together when they're gonna fight the English. And I think, uh, I don't know how I would describe circuit court or appeal <laughs> judges. The English? It is a difficult thing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not. But it is a difficult thing. Uh, but I, I, instead of creating something, I would just spread the good word. You know, I'm sure in San Diego you don't have the problems that you have in other places, do you? We are far better off than some places, but not as well off as, uh, as we were here. Yeah, and you know, that, that's just part of life. I think if Judge Marina's um, idea that, that there was the money and resources necessary and the respect and appreciation from the judiciary, we probably wouldn't have a committee like this and we'd probably have a hard time finding people to come say something about it. But unfortunately, I, I think as has been discussed, that's not, the case everywhere and I feel really fortunate to be in a district that's like that where we have resources available to us and we have the respect and the appreciation of our bench um, and I'm always amazed to hear the problems um, that exist in other places and while Judge Moreno's earlier comment about not divorcing the the defense function from the judiciary I probably agree with, and I love the judges, but maybe it's time for us to start seeing other people. 
And, <laughs> and specifically go, in this... Go see your congressman and your senator <laughs> and tell me who would you rather be with. Well, and so I think there are two issues. I mean, you, you're speaking to the, the, the bigger issue of the, uh, of the program administration as a whole. And, and what I want to talk about a little bit, and, and we have been discussing uh, throughout the course of our hearings, is the, is the more micro level of the... Uh, voucher review and, and activities and relationship between the judges and the, the CJA lawyers. And so I want to ask the other panel members. I mean, you've, you've heard Judge Moreno's remarks and some of the other judges who have advocated similar positions. And you've also, I know, been at these hearings and heard other folks talk about other models, such as panel administrators, what Judge Moreno would probably call bureaucrats. What do you think about other alternatives? What would you propose? What do you think about some of the things you've heard? Uh, and do you share concerns that Judge Moreno has about how putting that responsibility in the hand of bureaucrats, if you will, would impact the quality of representation? Because that's ultimately what we're about. And Gil, why don't we start with you? Well, first of all, again, I have, I'm blessed to be in a district where we don't usually get questioned about submission for experts and we don't usually get cut on our vouchers, but we are only one national election and a few senatorial appointments away from the days in 1980s where we did have voucher cutting issues. So I support those districts that have problems because our district could have a problem in the future. Uh, I believe a circuit, I shouldn't say a circuit, a panel administrator, however you choose to put them, either in a district or, or if it's too small in, in multi-districts, who is divorced from the judiciary, not appointed by the judiciary, not beholden to the judiciary, as our probation officers say. Uh, they're not arms of the court. Uh, they're, they're not you know, court family. These are people, and they're not bean counters. There are people who have practiced criminal defense, who know what it's like to plead a case and, and with all due respect to Judge Moreno, I think he made the comment that actually doesn't make the case. When you, are, when you have a plea on a massive fraud case, you don't see the work that's put into that, you as a judge. Uh, oftentimes I tell my panel lawyers, you know, I know that this is not above the cap, but I think you should submit a memorandum because you were the lead lawyer on this case. You were the one that the discovery came through. You were the one that disseminated to your, to your co-counsel. You were the one that took the lead on the motions. You were the one who took charge of the case. And what's going to happen is you're going to bill, and then what's going to happen, as Judge Moreno indicated, is somebody is going to charge something close to that, and the judge is going to look and say, well, well, that lawyer didn't do all the work. The only lawyer I saw was, was this lawyer. He was the one or she was the one that was making all the arguments and filing all the memoranda. And so sometimes I think it takes a look from someone, and I wouldn't call them a bureaucrat. I think they need to be somebody who's involved in the practice of criminal law or has been, who knows what it's like, who knows that in a situation where you've got problems lubricating a plea that you may have to go out to a, to a re remote location and talk to a defendant on multiple occasions. And, and I don't think it's the judiciary's job to decide how many times I should be contacting my client, how many times I should be involved with their family. They don't know what it takes for me to run my case. And I feel uncomfortable explaining that process to the same judge that is gonna be deciding my client's fate. I do a lot of work in child pornography cases. I do a lot of submissions for experts for forensic reviews. I do a lot of requests for psychologists. Oftentimes I don't use those individuals. And yes, I am concerned, even with the best and the brightest of the judges that we have, of, well, I didn't see that expert testify. I don't see anything concrete from that expert. And so am I getting my money's worth, so to speak? You don't have that problem with the U.S. Attorney's Office. The other thing I would add, and it's kind of related, and I, I do want to mention it, two things. One is the reason that, that U.S. Attorney Ferrer, in, in, in landscaping his, his uh, division chiefs, didn't see that there was a problem with voucher submissions for experts is, there shouldn't, he shouldn't know about them because they're submitted ex parte. So I don't know if there is a problem in the Southern District or not, but, but if there is, he wouldn't know about it because those things under Aki versus Oklahoma are supposed to be submitted under seal ex parte. 
Uh, and the other thing on, on discovery is, you know, we're in a situation where the U.S. Attorney's Office and, and Holder could do a lot to help us build less time by putting it in a format that we can read and access and guys like Russell Aoki and those folks can help us with. Right now, to use an audio analogy, you know, ATF may be using a 33 and a third LPM to get the, the, the thing to us. Somebody else is using an eight track player. Somebody else is using a cassette tape. Somebody else is using an MP3 player. And the government's response to me is, well, we don't control what those agencies use as a, as a platform. There needs to be some way to force the U.S. Attorney's Office to give it to us in a format that doesn't make us expend the time and inflate our invoices. We don't want to bill for that time. We'd rather be representing our clients, but we need to get the discovery in the format that's, that's you know, reasonable for us to be viewing. Uh, <clears throat> I agree with uh, Judge Marino. I don't think we need a, another agency to, to do what the, uh, the judges are now doing. Um, the system that's in place in South Carolina that's been discussed uh, by several speakers is working for us. What we have the problem is in some averaging at the district court level, maybe not over the cap, some over the cap, and then cases that are over the cap that are blessed by the trial judge in a letter to the chief of the Fourth Circuit saying, this lawyer did a great job, pay what he submitted, it's reasonable. And he was, one judge made the mistake of saying he was successful. The letter that came back from the Fourth Circuit is, success doesn't make any difference. All right? So, uh, it went back and forth and they paid, the, it's in the materials, they paid the lawyer uh, 4,000 left than the the term he used to me than the $8,000 haircut that the Fourth Circuit gave him to begin with. Um, so that's where the problems lie in our district. Um, I think success does matter. The length of time that you've had a client, uh, as Mr. Kahn said, being in the, at the jail with a client, how obstinate they could be, calls from their family, um, I want another lawyer, they're writing letters to the judge saying you're not doing your job. Uh, and you stick with the client and get the best results you can and get a good result. That takes time. The value is going to be higher. I think the, all those things have to be looked at. And finally, when a judge feels that he or she has to reduce a voucher, just notice to the lawyer so that it can be submitted to the CJA committee if that's possible in, in your district. I hope it will be possible in our district soon so that it can be aired. And maybe some guidelines will come out of it, some directives come out of it. So it happens less frequently. Thank you. In the Western District, um, a while back, the judges had uh, hired a, a, a new assistant to be in the pipeline of reviewing uh, CJ lawyer fee applications with the goal, apparently, of, of making sure they're accurate and finding obvious things that need to be fixed or whatever. Uh, the problem was it resulted eventually in what was discovered to be a big uh, blockage in the system uh, and didn't help. In fact, it was contributing to a massive delay. There was another added layer of bureaucracy that uh, backfired and, and that person no longer is in that job and that blockage has been eliminated. But I think that's an example of having another uh, layer of bureaucracy uh, of review by someone who's not particularly qualified to be reviewing uh, the vouchers. Uh, this person <coughs> wasn't a lawyer, was not a judge, they were just you know, a, a clerical person, and it, it really didn't contribute to anything positive. Um, right now it goes to the Federal Defender's Office where they have some expertise in reviewing these things, then it goes to the court, to the judge, individual judges' chambers, and, and uh, things are moving more quickly now, in general. So is that a, uh, is that an, so are you, are you, in, are you opposed to the review before judicial signature or are you in favor of it if it's done correctly or efficiently? Uh, if, it's, if it's done by someone who's, who's qualified to know what it takes to be a criminal defense attorney in a federal case, then you know, I don't think I have any problem with it unless it's going to be adding a massive uh, time delay because there's one person doing it for the entire district. But you know, if, 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 as long as there's someone who, who understands all the problems of getting a client who uh, is recalcitrant 
and not educated and is trying to get his head around mail fraud, wire fraud, money laundering, and you're trying to convince them of why the case against them is going to be successful and you have to battle to get them to take the plea, you know, or, or something like a, a Ponzi scheme hedge fund case where hedge fund case where it takes hours and hours and hours to review all the stuff and make sense of it before you, the attorney, can even give advice to your your client about, you know, do they have a case or not? I mean, somebody's got to be able to understand that. Uh, otherwise, if that person does not have that background in interviewing it, it's I think it, or, or in reviewing it, it's a waste. Um, but, so I think it depends on the qualifications of the reviewer. Um, the, the federal public defenders' offices that Judge Moreno is, is speaks so highly of around the country, and I, I, I do too from my own experience and from from everything I've heard. Um, they're they're an example of of a you know, a, a child that gets the money from their, their parent but has real autonomy with what they do. I mean, the, the judge wouldn't, no judge would think of, no judge would know what kind of decisions are made by someone like Mr. Khan about what experts to allow his assistants to use and what to suggest they do and which transcripts to order and just any of those um, decisions are, are made with, with a, a, a wonderful degree of autonomy by the public defender's office. So I, and I wouldn't call that a bureaucracy at all either. I would call it a, as Judge Moreno, I think, would call it a, an example of the way things uh, can work. So I think, um, uh, but I don't think that the defender office ought to be uh, reviewing any panel attorney's vouchers. I agree with everyone for, I won't go through them again, for all the different reasons that, that everyone that has disagreed with that has, has put forth. Um, just use to, in a word, it's just, there's just too much of a conflict. Um, an experienced, independent panel administrator uh, that has an understanding of all the things that defense attorneys go through and has a mandated degree of deference to, uh, to what the attorneys say happened. I mean, if, if I'm going to file a voucher and say I did these 95 things, um, as, as happens now, the person in the clerk's office literally goes one through 95 and makes sure that I did each of those things, whether it was attend a status conference or whether it was read a motion, and, um, and this is a case where they actually sit and read a motion, and so uh, they say, well, you know, the lawyer, it only took me two minutes to read that motion, so why does the lawyer bill for half an hour for reviewing that and doing something with it? And, and anyway, I, I think it needs to be a, a, an attorney. I think it needs to be someone with an appreciation of, of, of the defense function, and I don't think it would add any kind of bureaucracy. Uh, and, I, and I do think there also, as I said, needs to be uh, a, a degree of deference that's either in a statute or in a guideline or in a plan that has some teeth where where that person is told you know that 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 what an if an if an attorney that we have entrusted with panel membership says that this was a necessary thing to do there needs to be a really good reason for you to say that it's that it's not necessary and if it happens no so so if 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 somebody is abusing this, they shouldn't be on the panel. It's not, it's not a question of saying, well, let's, let's punish everybody. Let's make sure that everybody does every little thing. If somebody's found to be, I, I, I've seen abuses. They, they shouldn't be countenanced. But we shouldn't be presumed to be abusing. We should be presumed to be reasonable. We should be presumed to be rational. And we should be presumed to be professional. And that would, it would work. And it wouldn't be a bureaucracy. I started my career off at uh, MCRD Paris Island, which is just across the Savannah River in South Carolina, and I'm thinking it's time for me to move back to South Carolina. <laughs> but if I had my brothers, um, obviously, we need to have a federal public defender office. Um, I would like to have a panel administrator within that office, because I think they have, from everything I've heard, a tremendous amount of uh, resources and support and I know how hard they work to support their CJA panels from everywhere I've heard we obviously need a CJA panel and I have no objection to a panel that has a lot of input from the judges in regard to its makeup and its members and the qualifications of the lawyers um, but I also like the independence of somebody else looking at the vouchers that is done through a program administrator and in just running the program so that the cases are handed out fairly currently everything is controlled 110% by our judges, and, and, and that's very concerning. 
Uh, so if I were to wake up tomorrow and the 11th Circuit Council decided uh, they were going to pressure my district into adopting a federal public defender's office, uh, I would be very happy. Thank you. Thanks. We've got about 15 minutes left, and I, I want to give some other members of the committee an opportunity to ask questions in the remaining time. I have a question for Mr. Foster. Mr. Foster, yesterday we heard from Judge Cogburn about problems um, that were happening. Um, you had a CDO, I believe, in your district, and now it's going to be converted to an FDO, correct? Right. And one of the concerns we heard was that, um, and, and you were you are on the board, there's certain, uh, okay. Yes. And one of the concerns we heard um, was that um, the person that was selected to head the office, um, Judge Cogburn indicated, um, I think it's a she, that she has no trial experience, um, that, um, you know, I think the judges, at least my impression, was that they were somehow at a loss to understand how um, the head of this, how this CDO could make the decision to hire this person that has, it, the way it came across to me, very little uh, trial experience, very little federal court experience. Um, I, I, I know these are personnel decisions, but um, it, 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 did, did you guys hire someone with no federal experience to manage an office? No. I guess is my question. No, we hired someone who had been the first assistant in that very same office to uh, the original executive director, Claire Rauscher. She had become the first assistant when the previous first assistant left to take a job elsewhere. And then she remained the first assistant after Claire Rauscher left and another executive director uh, was hired, Henderson Hill. And so when he resigned, she had been in the job of first assistant for maybe three, or three years give or take, I'm not exactly sure. Uh, as far as trial experience, uh, it, may, it may be accurate that she did not try any federal trials, but she did a lot of federal uh, appellate work in the office before she, before she became first assistant. Also, she had practiced in South Carolina doing uh, capital defense work for some number of years before that. Uh, I cannot recall exactly whether she tried any cases, but she was in a practice that involved trial work, as my understanding, uh, the best of my recollection. Uh, and she was also very experienced at the time that we uh, picked her uh, as far as being in the office and doing a lot of federal uh, appellate work and my understanding sentencing and that sort of thing. And we felt uh, on balance that she was had the qualifications to be the administrator to lead the office. Um, and I just don't recall the, I don't be, recall us believing that she'd never tried a case in her life, but it may not have been the federal system, it may have been in, in the South Carolina state system. And just one other follow up question. How long have you been on that board? I believe roughly five years. Did the judges ever come to you with any complaints about the quality of representation that was being um, given by the office? Um, I mean, you were overseeing essentially as the board of the office. Did you ever have any communication from the judges or a desire to meet about issues involving the quality of representation coming from that office? Not that I recall. The only uh, thing that I can think of is it w there was an instance where one of the attorneys in, in the community defender office had done something that one of the judges believed was not a, a proper or ethical and that be that complaint became known and, and it was believed uh, that the judge was not happy with the office's response to that um, and the <coughs> communication that came between the executive director and the judge was not apparently satisfactory or the involvement of the executive director was not satisfactory. And at some point, somehow, we became aware of this. But to the best of my recollection, that was somewhat after the fact. And I don't recall that being presented to us as the board as something we needed to do something about. And I don't, and I don't recall anything ever being said about 
in general, the quality of the uh, representation by the attorneys in the office being subpar. Thank you. Any other members of the committee? Any follow up or? Yeah. I just want to ask if I could, uh, oh. Judge Moreno, in light of the comments of the rest of the panelists, does that impact or influence your views about this bureaucracy uh, in place of judicial review at all, or? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, let me tell you, uh, let me tell you, I do think, you know, we, first of all, the Southern District of Georgia, just try to get the federal defender. Don't ask for anything. <laughs> <laughs> just uh, do one step at a time, right? It doesn't because who the person is going to be, who appoints the person? <coughs> That's the first question, right? Who decides who it is? And I think these are uh, artificial issues. For example, who appoints the federal defenders? The Circuit Court of Appeals. And that doesn't mean that the federal defender is not an independent person and the office is not independent and they're appointed by the, not only are they appointed by the circuit court, but the circuit court judges can also remove a federal defender. Think about that. In fact, in, in the districts, if the president doesn't appoint uh, an, a U.S. attorney and the U.S. attorney doesn't get confirmed within, I think it's 120 days, there's a, a few months, guess who appoints? And we've done it in this district, the U.S. attorney. The judges, the district judges can appoint a U.S. attorney when there's a vacancy and enough time has gone by. Now that doesn't mean the U.S. attorney is not independent. I think it's kind of sad that we're talking about not trusting a United States district judge who's the one who decides habeas corpus, whether someone lives or dies, whether the sentence that your client is getting, that's even more important than $129, whether someone's getting life or not. If we trust the judges for that, why can't you trust them? The judges don't want to do it. So let me tell you, if you all came up with that and somehow or other were to be approved, the judges would be delighted about it, but about it because they don't have to do it anymore. It's a, it's a task. It's not a, a numbers task. It's a task of understanding what it takes to defend someone. Now, it is incumbent upon you all, and I know we do it in this district, to explain why you want to go over the cap. You tell me why you want to go over it. We usually know when a defendant is, is difficult because we get the letters from the defendants. We don't want this lawyer. So you judges know more than you all think. Now, there's sometimes we may not know, and then tell us, right? Uh, so I don't think, I think it's better than have another lawyer who may be a very good lawyer, but one lawyer who's going to oversee here. We've got all the judges here. They all have their cases. You want one administrator of vouchers for a whole district to review all of them. And you don't think it's gonna be, he's gonna do one of two things, either automatically approve everything until the money runs out, or there's gonna be a delay, and then it has to be approved by the circuit court anyway. Maybe that might be a solution, is take it away from the circuit court and defer to the district court who knows more than the circuit judge, because that's what you have now. Now you have the circuit court Delegate here in our circuit is Judge Jordan for the time being before then he gets rotated to look at something to oversee in case the district court judge didn't do it right. Then maybe you shouldn't do that and you should trust the district uh, judge, but you all don't want to trust the district judge. You want to trust the guy you're, who's going to be appointed by whom. Well, we haven't settled that yet, but I'm going to leave this because our reporter has some questions, um, and I want to get. Before he does, I, oh. I think, I think Mr. Jackman wanted to uh, say something. Just thank you. I just had one thing, and I don't want to leave today without mentioning it. First, again, thank you so much for what you do. I have an issue that I think would uh, would help me recruit more CJA panel lawyers of whatever age or diversity, and that's this. Under 18 United States Code 3006 Cap A, the way the federal district judges have read 
the, the statute is this. It's the old show flat rule, in for a penny, in for a pound, whether you're retained to represent the person or you're appointed to represent the person. And here's the problem. You're appointed to represent the client. The client is happy with you until the verdict comes in. The verdict comes in and all of a sudden he or she wants a different lawyer on appeal. It's just natural. The level of trust is, is gone. If it's not gone, it's certainly impaired. And the client would prefer a fresh set of eyes to look at that case and decide what the issues are on appeal. Most of the judges, including some very good judges in my district, have called me and said, you have a panel lawyer that represented this client. He got convicted. They filed a motion to withdraw, and they said, we are in, our firm, I, am incompetent to do the appeal. Well, I do a lot of 11th Circuit appeals, and let me tell you, they're no fun. They're no fun because they change the rules every six months on what's a record excerpt, you know, what's an appendix, what to include. They ship the briefs back, and I do a lot of this work. And yet, there are times when I get nasty grams from the 11th Circuit saying, you've got 14 days to correct this error. And most of the panel lawyers that are on my panel really would prefer that they not have to do the appeal, whether it's because of loss of trust with the client or just they're not competent to do it. They're trial lawyers. And it's, I think, a, a better solution to allow more flexibility to the district judge through a change in the statutory language where there's no presumption that just because the trial lawyer handled the case that he or she is going to be, and I think it's a matter of money, to be honest with you, that they'll be spending less money or vouchering for less to do the appeal. If you're a competent trial lawyer, you're going to read that appeal, you're going to read that transcript over again anyway, just as any good appellate lawyer would. So I think there needs to be some kind of wording in the statute to allow district judges who feel that they're somehow confined by this rule that you have to appoint the same lawyer to handle the appeal. I think it would encourage more lawyers to join uh, the panel if they didn't feel like they were burdened with having to do the appeal. John? Thank you. Um, Ms. Brill, I, I believe you recommended to the committee that they ought to take a look at the number of times that attorneys are asking for third-party service providers and how often those requests are granted. Well, the committee has some data that speak to some of them. And but putting aside our host uh, district, Southern District of Florida, which apparently is Shangri-La. <laughs> I thought South Carolina was Shangri-La. Uh, <laughs> Uh, deferential to our host here. Uh, looking at the five other districts that are on our panel here, the average number of representations in which a uh, panel lawyer asks for a third party service provider is 5.4% of the representations. Uh, and without identifying any one of your districts, uh, the low is 1%, and in that district, the average dollar amount is thirteen dollars. That would be us. Uh, <laughs> I, I admire your willingness to uh, accept responsibility. Uh, so here's the question I think um, the committee is going to be struggling with, which is, in your experience, is this a reflection of lawyers not asking for the uh, the record? The, experts, is it the court not granting it? And if it's former, if the attorney's not asking for it, do they not know to ask for it, or are they scared to ask for it? Yeah, I, I think it's everything you just said. I mean, speaking from my experience and about my district, it is, it is everything you said. I think, uh, I think there have been um, occasions in the past when lawyers have asked, and they've been denied, and they've been burned, and they've stopped asking. And I... I don't, I, you know, we can, we can talk about what is incumbent on the defense attorneys, and I am certainly someone who is, um, you know, to say the least, encouraging my fellow uh, attorneys to do this and to say more than, you know, really harassing my, my fellow. I mean, I think it's incumbent upon us to do it, but we don't, and some of the reason is because we've been denied. Um, we've been discouraged. We've been discouraged by the denials. We've been discouraged in more public, um, form about for about um, 
cost containment that we're still talking about in our district, and I wish somebody would just come, whether it's Judge Prado or for some circuit or some place, and say, you know, we're not in the time of cost containment anymore, and, you know, somebody needs to, with some authority needs to say that, but I think that we've been discouraged both by the denials and in um, public uh, about that. And um, I think that we as a group are not um, creative enough uh, to ask enough. And I put myself in that group and I was, my eyes were opened not at a, my eyes were opened at a recent um, panel rep national conference when the theme was, you know, around the country, you people need to start asking for more experts. And I, I learned why that was the case and I tried to transmit that to my fellow panel attorneys, but I don't think there's a culture among panel attorneys in general that, you know, you really need, that, that, that the more you put into a case, the more you get out of a case. I, I don't think people have that experience. I, I don't think they, they are encouraged to have that experience and I think they need to be trained more to get it. So I think the blame is everywhere. I think the, as I said earlier, the numbers speak for themselves and um, I think that that's, it just, it just has to change. I mean, it's so, every, every anecdote, to the point where it's not anecdotal, um, indicates that, that third party providers, psychologists, weapons specialists, fingerprint specialists, copy services that can, you know, call out documents based on bait stamp pages, any kind of third party service provider you can think of makes that makes your rep makes a defense attorney's representation of their client better, enhances it. So I, 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 I maybe you wanted a more precise answer, but I think you your question uh, begged all of those different um, causes. Well, first of all, I think when we broke, you were asked if you could furnish the statistics to us that you just recited, and you said you weren't sure that you could release that document. Correct. I, I do not know whether that's possible. That is why I'm not telling you what your numbers are. Right. Well, the problem is if, if we don't know that there's a problem, we can't address the problem with our CJA panel lawyers. I have no idea what the number is in my district uh, for you know requests for experts. If you'll tell me what it is and how it compares to the other districts and whether it's out of line, I'll educate my panel members to be asking for more experts because in my district, the judges will approve it. But I have no idea because I don't have the data. And the data to me should not be a, a secret. Uh, it, it, I don't know of anything that would be proprietary about what you just described. I think that should be shared with the panel reps throughout the 94 districts so that we can encourage our panel lawyers that aren't asking for experts to do so. So just to, Gil, I'm in complete agreement with you. It should be shared and I can tell you your public defender has the data and has the authority to share it with his panel. Thank so you. please go to him and, and ask for that data. I, just one quick. I promise there'll be a short answer. <laughs> Ms. Brill, I, I guess I'm trying to figure out the Puerto Rico situation. Is it something that just developed since sequestration? Was it there five years ago? Was it there 10 years ago? Is it just, you said attitude, is it the attitude of the particular judges? In, in this committee trying to f remedy situations, we take the risk of, to remedy the situation in Puerto Rico, we could affect Judge Moreno's district, who might not have a problem. So do we concentrate on, on certain districts where it is a district problem, or is it, is it a systemic problem that we have to set up rules and regulations that are gonna affect everyone so that Puerto Rico doesn't happen around the country? Um, it's, it, there have been waves, I've been, there, I've been uh, practicing there since 1990, I've been a panel attorney since 1993. Um, so it was forty dollars an hour when I started. It wasn't twenty dollars an hour, but it's you know it was down there. Um, it, it, it's there've been waves, and it's certainly driven by personality. And sometimes we like to say that Puerto Rico is a land of men and not laws, but but um, it's 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 not the it's not it's not the wild west either. There's there's we have a very good plan, and and it's but but like every plan, it's, it's ambiguous. So, so, you know, you heard the chief judge saying that we adhere to the plan and we, we, we kind of do adhere to the plan, but, but it's not a, not with, not with an attitude of respect, not with an attitude of, of deference, not with an attitude of, of, um, 
of, of professionalism on, on any side here. So, so um, you know, we, we, have a, we have a good plan. We have 10 judges, half and half. You know, half are, I, lawyers will call them abusive, and half are fantastic, and, and, and like many judges uh, um, describe their districts. Um, something that, I mean, and, that, and isn't, that the, isn't that what 94 districts are all about and 13 circuits are all about? And is, aren't we supposed to let some things um, uh, develop and evolve on their own, perhaps? It's something that can be done, something, I think that the way to fix Puerto Rico um, needs to come from the First Circuit. It hasn't come from the First Circuit. The First Circuit has proven unwilling, and, and if I, if somebody could, help me or help somebody in my district figure out how to get the First Circuit to really take a stand on what's right and what's wrong. I can't I think even that get the Fifth it. Circuit fixed, much less another. <laughs> I think national, so, so particularly, the particular problems of Puerto Rico, I think the First Circuit right now needs to, needs to fix them, and I, I would, I'm trying, I'm hoping, I'm, I want that to happen. I think nationally what you can do as if you haven't already done it two or three or how many times is it now, um, is um, a, 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 what I said before, a national standard of, of enforced deference. Uh, and and I, I think while you might say that respect has to, it has to grow organically, I think we need to enforce um, respect for what criminal defense attorneys do. And, and it's not just criminal, it, the retained bar gets the respect. Panel, somebody that was sitting in this seat earlier, you know, explained how, as a retained attorney, she didn't have these these problems. The federal defenders' offices, as a whole, get this respect. So it's the it's the panel attorneys that are representing indigent people that that don't get the respect, and it needs to get enforced. It needs to get enforced at a national level. And the places where it's happening, you know, great. It's the, you don't you're not going to make anything worse. And in the places where it isn't happening, people need to be not get the message, not have it trickle down. But be told that that what defense attorneys do is essential, and to a certain extent, it is protected. And uh, that that extent, I, I think we can. I think we can agree on a. If we're going to call that protection a kind of a, a bubble that protects it, I guess that's not a very positive word. But but I think we could sit here and between all of us, we'd probably define that bubble in, incredibly similar. You know what? What needs to be? What just needs to not be touched about this process? Um, and if, and if, if that can be done at a national level, I think it would um, aid my district. The very particular problems of 2016, I think we need the intervention of of the First Circuit at this point on on that. Thank you. It's time we've got to wrap it up now. We're a little bit over time, and it's been a long day after a long two days. I want to thank all of the panel members. Uh, you are very helpful. I want to thank uh, the, the Southern District in general and Judge Moreno in particular for his hospitality and the loan of his courtroom, and we really appreciate all the assistance that you have given us. Here. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, and I think we need to be upstairs for just a little bit to wrap up.